Here we go. So now we should be working. So do you want to say something to see if that's... All right. Uh, my name is Crazy Kaylee. This is an interview. Are we just checking audio levels or something? No, no, I hit the record button. Uh, and and the thing is going Not up, bad. so we're in business. Hello, and welcome well, to the right. After Party. Good. Hi. Hi. How's it going? I'm Crazy Kaylee. And I'm Sharper. And this is an interview podcast with Spy Party Players. Today we're talking with Crazy Kaylee, who works as a criminal defense attorney in the lovely that state of California. In... Hello? Hello? Uh, yes. Am I coming through? Yes. You're coming through. Awesome. Yeah. I, I heard you just fine. But yeah, yes, I do work as a criminal defense attorney. Cool. So um, we're definitely going to talk about that. The, the first thing I wanted to ask you about, um, uh, I saw like in, in the social media places that you're taking part in a rally, a, a protest rally coming up. Uh, no, that was actually uh, yesterday that I did that. It's a, um, so it's, it's the March for Science. Um, it's not, I mean, I, I prefer not to think of it as a protest rally, although that's de facto kind of what it was. Um, cause it was, uh, it turns out that if you look at people who believe that, um, you know, public policy should include, you know, empiricism and science and, uh, you know, and respect for facts. It turns out that you get a lot of people who don't like Donald Trump so much. So they, um, <laughs> they sort of, uh, some people wanted it to be an anti-Trump kind of thing. Um, well, I'm not noted for being a fan of uh, Donald Trump. I, I, I was, I preferred it to more think of it as a March for science than, you know, rather than against any specific person and just, uh, I wanted to express my point for, or my uh, support for that world viewpoint, basically. Right, right. Um, was 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 that? Did you get the feel that that was the sort of temperament that most of the people were there for, in, instead of it being more about uh, political? Uh, no, campaign? to be to be honest with you, like I think the organizers really tried hard to to make it that. Um, a lot of the you know quote unquote official protest content because they had speakers and so forth. Uh, that, that was just stressing, like, no, global warming is a real problem. Uh, here's the science behind it. Um, there were a lot of folks who wanted to just, you know, emphasize how important the work that scientists do is um, and and talk about, you know, various problems that scientists are working on. But, I mean, to be honest, a lot of, like, you know, the rank-and-file protest was just, was, was just real, real severe anti-Trump anger. Yeah. So um, I, I think the... It was it was a mix between the two. It was a mix between the two. Okay. Are you, are you, are you still glad you win? And again, like I'm I'm not necessarily unsympathetic to people who are very angry at Donald Trump. So, <laughs> uh, you know, I'm not I'm not going around blaming those people. Um, but I think it's important to note too that um, this wasn't explicitly stated by a lot of people at the protest, I think, but, you know, anti-scientific attitudes uh, persist in the American left just as much as they do uh, in the American right, I would think. Right. Uh, or maybe not just as much, but they're, they're certainly very prevalent. Um, you know, there, there's, um, so I'm, I'm a, I am a, I think anyone would tell you, a pretty radically materialist kind of, uh, uh, kind of person. And, um, so I'm, for instance, very much against GMO labeling even because um, I think the science on that issue is very clear. But, you know, a lot of folks on, in the American left want GMOs to be labeled or banned or regulated, uh, you know, in the, in, in the absence of, you know, or what I perceive to be the absence of any evidence that they're harmful. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, yeah, so, so science uh, or scientism, as it's, as it's often dismissed by political opponents, <laughs> Um, is not a viewpoint that necessarily um, has a partisan uh, preference. Uh, I mean, there are, there are things that scientists would say is true that, you know, is found unpopular by people on both sides of the political spectrum. Although I think what was expressed at that rally was that it, it tends to fall very heavily on one side these days. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, which, which is probably where... Where, where it becomes a problem in being treated as uh, as partisan in the fact that uh, because there's like a perceived correlation between the left and um, scientific rigor, then then that suddenly skews any any re research that's that's put out as being oh that's just like people speaking from the left instead of no this it, is exactly. like in, in, independent exactly. of 
political allegiance. Hmm. View is liberal bias. Like, not like no, no, it's really not. It's just you're gonna <laughs> you're gonna attack. Them. Like, like some people find it convenient to attack the scientific method by you know associating it with. Uh, you know, oh, well, this is stuff that, you know, Bernie Sanders likes, you know, so therefore be scared of it. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, ignore peer review, ignore, you know, people who have expertise in their professions. I, I think it's not necessarily, I guess, part of it that so alarms me, although certainly um, the science part of it does alarm me. I think, I think the fact that science... Um, and scientists uh, are, you know, their opinions have a lot less weight. Is more, uh, is, is it's more of a symptom than it is, you know, the the, the problem itself, the underlying problem. I mean, it's it, there's a decay of, um, and, and I think this is the reason I went to the protest. There's a decay of respect for facts and for you know the objectively verifiable reality in which we all live, um, and you know, subjective truth. Is more important um, in the modern world than than objective truth, um, or you know, or whatever you want to define as the closest we can come to objective truth, because you know, extreme skepticism is a thing and so forth. But hmm. um, but I think that's that's very dangerous, uh, and that's that's why I went to the rally, basically. Okay. Well, that that, that um kind of serves as a good sort of introduction to, to discussing your um uh, your. Career, career path working as, as a lawyer um uh because I, I wanted to start that discussion sort of <laughs> um within whatever like range you feel comfortable with sort of talking about your your past of like what drew you to this profession and this um uh uh this this path in your life of becoming a, a professional lawyer what drew me to being a lawyer um i literally cannot remember a time uh, when I did not want to be a lawyer. Um, I, I'm, I, there must have been a moment um, long ago where I found out what a lawyer was and decided to be a lawyer, but I don't, I don't have a memory. My memory doesn't go back that far. Um, I, I can always remember wanting to be uh, a lawyer, wow. a particular kind of lawyer that I am. I, I remember knowing about courtrooms and, about, and I understood what the, what the law was and I thought that was so cool. I thought that I thought that was, you know, just. Um, and I and I still feel this way today. I thought that was like kind of at the heart of what of what civilization is. You know, like we're gonna we're gonna talk out our problems instead of you know beating each other with rocks or something. Um, and I, I, I thought that was you know really something that was well suited to my my talent seem from a very young age. Mm -hmm. um, so when I think I think I was I do remember this uh, exact moment. I I learned when I was eight in a civics. I mean, it wasn't a civics class because at eight you don't go to civics class. You just you know have your your teacher who's teaching you everything teach you about civics. At least that's the way it works in the United States. Um, and we were getting a civics lesson, and I learned what a public defender was. Um, and that idea was very impressive to me. So you know, in a in a lot of societies, you know, the government, uh, and including the United States, the, the government views it as its duty to you know protect the public from crime uh, and to prosecute and punish criminals. Um, and for that purpose, you know, of course the government needs to have, you know, a legal prosecutor, you know, police forces, law enforcement, but here's this idea that it's, we live in a society that views it as equally important to give the defendant, uh, competent and zealous, uh, representation. Um, and, you know, I think when I when I when I uh, got got this job working here, I made a post that kind of encapsulated this idea. But um, and this kind of goes back to the science stuff we were talking about. Yeah. Um, you know, strong strong ideas need to seek out um, skepticism, and they need to seek out uh, you know challenges. Um, and we really really need for reasons that maybe I'll discuss later. Like that, we really need the fact of someone's guilt to be a strong truth. And so that's that was very impressive to me when I learned that, that the government hires a lawyer to try to prevent the government's other lawyer from obtaining a conviction. Um, <laughs> that, that sort of demonstrates like the, the fair play of, of the judicial, of the criminal judicial judicial system uh, in the United States. Mm -hmm. Ever yeah. since I've been eight, eight years older. So I wanted to be a, a public defender and uh, nothing has really deterred me or changed me much since then <laughs> uh, to change that opinion. Um, 
I'll relate one more story before I actually let, sorry, I'm, I'm talking forever, but no, before dude, you this ask is, another question, I'll, uh, this is yeah, like the, exactly. That's kind of the, the dream, dream for a podcast yeah. interview is like, yes, the person just like wants to, to, to tell the story. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, I, I just need to shut I'll, up. I'll tell you one more away. story. Yeah. yeah, yeah, go. There you go. There you go. Um, so the, the last thing I'll say, uh, that, so I always, this did, this wasn't my call to become a public defender. I already wanted to be a public defender when this happened, but this was like a, um, an affirming moment for me was um, when I think, I think I was um, 13 or something like that, 13, 14, somewhere in that age range, you know, just starting high school or just finishing up with uh, middle school. And um, I got sent by my school to go to Sacramento along with a couple of other kids. And, you know, it was the school thing uh, where they got funding to send some kids there. And, you know, they got a tour of the Capitol and they got to visit some courthouses and they got to learn how government worked, you know, from, from the inside out, basically. Yeah. Um, and we visited a number of uh, courtrooms one day. And uh, on the list, there was going to be a, uh, a family court, which uh, I, I, I did family law when I was a private attorney for a while. And it's, it's family law. It's not, it's not my favorite. Um, where there was a, a civil lawsuit in progress, and we were going to visit a criminal court. Um, so obviously, I was most excited about the criminal court going in. And we go in. <laughs> Um, who I mean must must be dead by now I would assume but he was in his um, his early 70s um, and he uh, he was black and he was active in the civil rights movement uh, in the 60s um, and he became a lawyer during the during the civil rights movement um, and practiced for years and years and became a judge um, and as, as he described it to me that, so, so what happened is, um, you know, we're all the kids are sitting down in the, in the, in the, in the bench or in the uh, benches behind the, the spectator area of the courthouse. And, uh, he, he just starts talking to us a little bit, you know, just talking about what happens in that courtroom. He was running a trial department. So, you know, he's doing criminal trials. Um, and he talks about, he's, you know, doing a little question and answer, a little Socratic method as we, as we love to do in the law. And he, uh, he asks us uh, as a whole, who, who do you think I see? Who do you think I get in here? You know, who do you think comes into this courthouse? Um, and, uh, you know, the, the general consensus is of the, of, the, what, of the shouted response is like, oh, criminals, bad guys, drug dealers, right? Um, and I say people who have been accused of crimes because I'm, you know, I, I was Kaylee even then. <laughs> uh, and, he, and he points at me, he goes, that's, you know, he bang, he's very forceful. He's, he likes to gesticulate in a forceful way. He bangs the table. That's right. People who have been accused of crimes, you know. So, uh, like, me and this judge are, are on the same wavelength. Um, and so the, uh, the rest of the group is going to head to the civil courtroom. But, but I asked to stay behind to talk to this guy some more because I, I, you know, this guy's living the dream as far as I'm concerned. And he's, he, he's probably a personal hero of mine without me knowing it. Uh, mm -hmm. And so they say, okay. So he, he takes me back into his chambers and uh, I get to know him a little. That's, that's how I learned he was where he did the civil rights movement. He, you know, start, entered the criminal justice system. And he did that um, to the derision of a lot of his former colleagues in the civil rights movement. Cause you know, to some people it appeared to, that he was, you know, becoming a part of the system, you know, so to speak. You know, he was no longer a critic. He was a, he was a defender uh, of the system. And he said, and the way he put it is, of course, I'm a defender of the system. Like, if we didn't believe in the system, why were we doing those protests? You know, why would we give it that credit of, you know, being a, a society or an organization that, you know, would be responsive to change um, mm. as well? But he, he asked me uh, during the course of this conversation, this is the point that I've been laboriously getting to. Um, he asked me what did I wanted to do uh, with my life, basically. What do you want to be when you grow up kind of question. And I told him I want to be a public defender. <laughs> and, and public defenders hadn't come up in the conversation yet. But I, I remember he like closed his eyes and he sort of sighed a little bit. And I think he maybe like nodded. Like, you know, it was just, it was like I had told him like, you know, I, you know, I wanted to like, uh, you know, mine coal for 20 years. Like, like, like the expression yeah, on his yeah. face is like, yes, that's important, but I feel very bad for you. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like his, so. his, his sympathy coming out. He's like, kid, you don't know what you're getting. Yeah, exactly. Yourself into. Exactly. He's like, you're 13. You don't know what the <laughs> hell you're talking about. Like, but, but God bless the man. He treated it with, with such dignity. Um, he had, the, he had this, he, he was not a man of subtle taste. I'll tell you that every, everything in his courthouse was, 
was big and loud and, and, and ostentatious, and, and he, had, he had a big personality too. So on his desk, he had the statue of, uh, of Justice, you know, the lady with the scales and the sword, oh, yeah. and it was big. Uh, it, was, it was like two, like one or two, like two feet, I think, would be appropriate. It, like, it was taller than, it, sitting on his desk, it was higher than the level of his head, basically. Ah, if, um, if, if he'd and, gone bigger, if he'd had a light, uh, like one the, the, the size of a person, he could have used it as, as his like coat rack or hat rack. <laughs> exactly Damn. right like just Missed make it you know, full human size yeah, waste, waste the opportunity way. exactly hmm. uh, he, he he had uh, he had like a bunch of stuff from like you know he'd been on the bench for like 20 years or something and um, he they tried to actually promote him to appell appellate courts um, uh, he'd been they wanted to appoint him to appellate courts but he'd always refused um, because he wanted to stay in the criminal trial department, saying this is where the important works get gets done, and that's this is where I can make the most difference. Hmm. Um, um, so, Bob, so sorry, sorry, real quick, what's a, a pellets court within the the hierarchy of um, uh, the courts? Uh, so, um, and you can learn more about this in the law lecture that I'll be delivering on Twitch, twitch.tv forward slash Crazy Kaylee, uh, before too long. Uh, but uh, so in California, so there are state courts and federal courts, which are which are different entities. Um, he was a state of California uh, trial court judge, so he was a um, what we would call a uh, California superior court judge uh, for the county of Sacramento. Um, above that is the uh, well. Often every county will have its own appellate court. Um, so the county of Sacramento will have an appellate division on which the judges sit, the judges who hear the normal trials just sit on that court in rotation, basically. Uh, then above that, you have the uh, courts of appeal. Uh, California is divided up into several districts um, to hear appeals from the, from the county trial courts. The California Supreme Court. So he had received an appointment to the uh, court of appeal. Uh, for I forget which district Sacramento was in, but for whatever district Sacramento was in, and he turned it down because he wanted, and, and that's basically a promotion for a judge. Hmm. At least it's an indication of respect for your long tenure, uh, for your knowledge of the law, et cetera, et cetera. But, but he turned it down because he said, you know, actually doing the trials and dealing directly with, you know, the people whose lives are at stake um, is uh, what he wanted to do. Um, so anyway, this, the, 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 find, the, the moment where the life-affirming, yes, you made a good decision, Kaylee, uh, moment was, so he lays his hand on this giant, uh, Austin really ostentatious statue of justice, and he, and he has that same pained look on his face that he has when I tell him I want to be a public defender, and he says, you know, things, things are going to be really hard for you, um, and there are going to be a lot of people and a lot of things, uh, I forget exactly what he says, but something to the effect that there are going to be a lot of people and things standing in your way. Uh, or trying to stop you, or you know, making this a, a difficult journey for you, um, but like real, and, and I don't, I, t I to this day don't know if he was just a really good lawyer and actor who made the sound really genuine, or if it came from a really genuine place within him. He said, "We we really need you, though. You know, we really really need you, and the work that you know you can do for us, or something to that effect." And he emphasized it, it was very generational to me, like it like. To, to him, like, it was really important that, you know, the mission he was on be carried forward. Mm -hmm. um, so, and yeah, that, that was obviously really cool and touching for me. Um, so I've carried that memory with me uh, as far as I go. So I guess that's the, the full story and everything I can tell of why and when and how did I ever want to become a lawyer. I mean, I'd already been wanted to be a lawyer at that point, but at that point I was like, well, yeah, I mean, this guy's, this guy's giving me the, the real call to the bar there, as we say. Um, so yeah, I think that's about all. <laughs> so in that's... answer to the for very first question you asked me, that's that's all I've got on it. That's about the best answer I could ever expect. I mean, that's that's kind of crazy. The crazy Kaylee from age eight with his, that that firm in his sense of morality and the value of civics. Like most kids are still playing Pokemon by that point. That's very well. Pokemon hadn't been invented yet, you know. So if Pokemon oh, yeah, was sorry. invented, you know, in this... you know 1990, bam, you know, I'd just be <laughs> out there doing my esports career right now. Mm -hmm. uh, but no, I don't know. But no, that that I don't know. It's something intrinsic to my character. I think I I really care about um, abstract concepts like that and the way they affect you know society in abstract ways. And um, I don't know. It's it, it's it's a I have a, a very uh, a very 
specific worldview, I guess I'd call it. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I just, I don't remember ever feeling any other way. Mm -hmm. That That's um, in interesting, something, something you bring up, that, that um, a value of uh, ab abstract concepts, that to, to me is perhaps something, uh, w one of the like key problems in the, the undervaluing of the uh, effective functioning of a judicial system is that for, for, for most of us, for most people, we struggle or don't put the effort into valuing abstract concepts and instead value things very much that are um, subjective or direct to our day-to-day -day experience. And mm -hmm. so some, something like um, effective um, judicial pro process just doesn't resonate with people as much despite its like supreme importance in uh, like a nation functioning or a community sure, functioning. Sure, sure. Yeah, that's very true. Um, and part of your job when you're a criminal defense lawyer is to um, persuade people who feel that way about <laughs> it. Uh, so, so you get very good at understanding uh, what people's uh, thoughts are going in. Uh, and th that doesn't just apply to jury members. So, I mean, like if I'm at a party talking to people I don't know, uh, and they learn that I'm a lawyer, uh, the next question will be, what kind of lawyer are you? And then I'll tell them what kind of lawyer I am. Uh, and then you can probably guess what the next question after that they ask is. Uh, but the, it's the kind of infamous question that all criminal defense attorneys get, and that's how can you do that? Um, like how, like, and or followed immediately by like, what if they're guilty? Like, how can you defend someone who's guilty? You know, they think they think that you know criminal defense attorneys should only defend them after after you know that that scene in every you know Phoenix Wright game where <laughs> or every case in Phoenix Wright where he like talks to them in the jail and becomes you know really deeply sincerely convinced of their innocence and now he's on a crusade right like that's the only way you, they could be criminal defense attorneys in good conscience because otherwise they'd be defending someone who's guilty and that's you know horribly wrong um, and yeah like so part of it is. Um, certainly, like in a con to without delving into the abstract, you know, idealistic crap. Um, like, still, the person who is guilty deserves. Uh, I would say, um, you know, if the fact that they're guilty doesn't mean that they're denied their rights to due process, to you know, have their punishment be reasonable. You know, there are a lot of things a lawyer can do for someone, um, including someone who's just who's guilty and is going to admit it. Um, so there, there's a lot more going on than just like, oh, is he guilty or is he innocent? Hmm. Well, is yeah, this, this, these abstract concepts, these nebulous abstract concepts, which are so important. Um, and I guess the trick I've found is that you have to make it concrete for most people. Uh, most folks are not going to relate unless you get them to like, well, if we didn't do it, here's what the real world consequences of that would be. And here's why that would be something that you would think is bad. So, you know, like a, a common example um, is... Um, we have in the U.S. Constitution the Fourth Amendment, which guarantees that people sh will not be subjected to unreasonable warrantless searches. Um, and this amendment is what most people are referring to uh, when they say that someone gets off on a technicality. Uh, because if, the, if there's a search performed, I mean, suppose you perform a search which violates this amendment, you know, you just randomly haul someone over. Uh, you know, you're a police officer, you just grab someone off the street and start searching them for no reason at all, and you find, I don't know, some meth, some meth on them or something. Hmm. Um, you know, I can get that evidence suppressed, which means it would never be introduced at trial, which means there's no case, which means it has to be dismissed, which would result in a lot of people saying, I got him off on a technicality. Um, I uh, imagine... Is an it, oh, yeah, sorry. go ahead. No, um, I, I was just going to say, I imagine this is the process that you follow a lot of the time, given how, how often I've heard of uh, uh, warrantless searches being practiced. Sure, sure. So, I mean, that, that's that's another complicated law issue. Um, so, a warrantless search is not necessarily an unreasonable search. So, so there are oh. certain searches which you don't have to have a warrant for. So, for instance, if you arrest, so if you see someone shoot someone in cold blood, uh, and you arrest them and you put the handcuffs on them, you're allowed to search them. Uh, for you know your own safety and so forth. So if you find the meth on them at that point, even though you didn't have a warrant, it's still a quote unquote reasonable search. And there are a lot of exceptions like that. Um, you know, for instance, um, uh, if an officer sees something in plain sight, like just walking down the street, you know, on the t on the back of your car that you have parked, you know, you got a big old you know bundle of heroin. You know, fair is fair. That's not even really a search. Hmm. Um, and then so so that that's that's a whole class in law school basically. But but yes, I do get plenty of. Um, 
of uh, cases where there are Fourth Amendment violations. Um, and you know, police are sort of half encouraged to toe that line because you know they're in the part they're they're in the business of gathering evidence. Um, and, um, you know, they do their jobs effectively when they gather good evidence right. and, you know, they are sort of incentivized to come as close to that line as they can without crossing it. Um, and so they do, uh, and some do it more, more aggressively than others, let's say, and that, that leads to some evidence being suppressed uh, a lot of the time. Hmm. Um, uh, but yes, so, so but back to the, the abstract concepts thing for just a second. Um, yeah, so people will say like that. You know, you got him off on a. Oh, hello. So I think you dropped. Sorry, sorry. You still there? No, I'm yeah. back. I'm back. back. Yes, I'm. I'm, cool, I'm cool. still here. Yep. Yeah. Um, sorry, I think I, I accidentally hit F5 on my keyboard. And <laughs> the, uh, the Discord. Page. Um, so. Yeah, exactly. So they'll, they'll say you got him off on a technicality, and I'll say like, uh, that seems like an odd term to describe the United States Constitution. You know, like it's not really a technicality. <laughs> it's it's sort of a basic right, you know, kind of mm -hmm. enshrined into our foundational law, law you know. Um, and I'm like, I mean, you got to consider a world where, you know, the Fourth Amendment doesn't exist. Like if, if we don't dismiss cases where, you know, police, you know, just search people in blatant disregard of people's rights. I mean, what incentive do they have to like not just, you know, randomly start checking houses, you know, or the police were going to come through, you know, open your door. And then, and, and, you know, this starts to look a little uncomfortable. You know, we're starting to live in, you know, pick your favorite dystopian novel here, um, you know. Hmm. And so these these rights are important. And um, is, is this where the concern is? It's of, not um, the, just important. Uh, uh, I was just going to ask real quick: it is is this where the concern of the stop and stop and frisk policy uh, relates to? So stop and frisk is a, is an interesting a variant on Fourth Amendment law. So that um, when a police officer has uh, a reasonable belief that someone is both armed and dangerous, uh, they can perform a sort of real quick perfunctory search just for weapons. Or anything else that might be dangerous, like if the person's carrying like a needle or something to inject drugs with, that might you know be able to be used to hurt someone. They can do that, and they can pat the person down. And you know, sometimes courts you know make decisions that have some real impractical, uh, real world applications. They're only allowed to pat them down for weapons if they like feel something that's clearly not a weapon. They're supposed to leave it alone. But I mean, you can imagine that this is a very difficult real world case, right? Like yeah. officer pats down person for weapons in good faith, you know, finds a gun maybe, uh, but also finds, you know, the, the soft plastic baggie, you know, with a leaf like substance in it, you know, I like, what are the chances that that doesn't come out in one way or another at eventually, you know? So, um, yeah, that, that's, that's what we call a stop and frisk law or, or Terry blog based on the Terry v. Ohio case. Okay. Um, yeah, but yeah, that, that's very much in the, in the same realm. Um, but to conclude, uh, I would say, um, yeah, it, it's important uh, to be a defender of those of those abstract ideals. You know, like you know, the person's right to be free of of searches, uh, unreasonable searches, and most importantly, the person's right to not be convicted of a crime without very very strong evidence. You know, beyond a reasonable doubt is the words we or are the words we use, uh, and that's a very high standard of proof. Mm -hmm. It's a, there's a very very seductive trap in there for a lot of a real true believer Kool Aid drinking type uh, lawyers who really <laughs> believe in that, and that's losing track of the person in front of you. Um, in every case, there is a real human being, um, Bob Wright, um, you know, faces real severe, uh, real life altering consequences. Um, if you if you go to jail for a week, that's that's you know a lot of people lose their job if that happens, you know. So, um, you know, you, you've got you know severe consequences at stake here. Sometimes, you know, of course, you know, in murder cases, people's actual lives we uh, still kill people here in the United States, uh, e even here in California. Um, and um, so sometimes, yeah, you've literally got a person's life in your hands. Um, and if you find yourself advocating. You're gonna, you know, try and change the system. You're gonna, you know, protest the system's injustice. If you're doing that at the cost of, you know, the client that's in front of you, uh, you're not doing your job, in my view. And in fact, you're you're doing like the mortal sin for any lawyer, which is selling out your client for the benefit of something else. Because um, you know, when a client has you as your lawyer, you know, even if they didn't hire you, even if you're your pu their public defender, you owe them 
uh, that you know, a, they they have a great trust in you that you need to you need to fulfill. So I think, yeah, those abstract stuff. That abstract stuff is very important. That's part of the reason we do the job. Uh, but it always has to be in service of uh, you know your actual individual client. Yeah, yeah. So 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 you're always having to balance or be, or be aware of ideology, practicality, and humanity. Sure, and in, and oftentimes I find when you're a public defender that those three kind of join up in a in a happy synchronicity. But <laughs> you you have to you have to beware uh, of cases uh, where they do not. You have to. I mean, a common place where it comes up is the is the public defender who um, wants to try too many cases and urges their clients to fight cases that maybe they shouldn't. Um, so, you know, if you have a client who's facing very serious consequence X, and you know he's got a good argument to be made, and you know it just it just burns you how unjust the the thing the police did is, and you really want to fight it. Um, but the prosecutor knows there's a problem with what the police did, and they offer a sort of middling deal. You know, you've got, you can, and, and, but it's a good deal for the client because, you know, they'll get to keep their job or, uh, you know, they won't have to go to jail for that long hmm. or they won't suffer immigration consequences, which is a very hot button issue for us right now. Um, you know, if, if you get, if they get something they want, you have to realize that it's not about, you know, fighting and winning the battle necessarily. And it, it might, you might have to be okay with the fact that that cop, you know, gets to live another day doing, you know, this objectionable practice or whatever. Um, because you have to do what's best for your client first, uh, even if that means giving up the fight uh, in some cases and taking a plea deal, for instance. Right, right. Wow. Um, can we can can we talk about that? I'm I'm curious to 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 ask and like uh, feel, feel feel free if any, any of this becomes uncomfortable or, or isn't something you want to delve into. Um, sure. There's ob obviously on the international stage like a lot of attention being drawn to the balance of power between the United States judicial and executive branches um, in that they, for the first time, as, as far as I can recall, are like being framed in adversarial terms that the executive branch, or at least the White House, is treating the judicial system as an enemy of their policy decisions or um, uh, policy intentions. Sure, sure. Um, well, I mean, I think so. It's so it's it's not quite accurate, and it's uh, to say that like that's the first time it's been viewed that way. I mean, in part, it was designed that way uh, mm. by the people who framed the United States government. Um, you know, the judiciary is always supposed to have been acting as a check uh, on you know the executive, and and vice versa. You know, the executive appoints the the Supreme Court justices in the first place. Um, and, you know, and Congress checks the both of them and is checked by, you know, the, the, the three-way check as every, you know, uh, eighth grader in the United States who's paying attention uh, to their classes can tell you. <laughs> uh, the, um, I, I, think, I think it's historically naive to say that that's, that's never been the case before, as some people indeed, you know, a lot of press makes a big deal about, yeah. oh, this has never happened before. Like, no, I, it's always I mean, been, yeah, it's always I been just... this dirty. It's always <laughs> been this dirty. I mean, the very first, the very first notable case um, that uh, where the unit where the Supreme Court actually asserts its authority to perform judicial review um, is a check on the executive. Um, it, so that's Marbury versus Madison, which is one of the most important cases um, in United States legal precedent. Um, that's the case, which is sort of the foundation for the Supreme Court's power to review, uh, you know, executive actions and legislative authority for for compliance with the Constitution, basically. And in that, they were dealing with a case um, where, uh, uh, you know, the president wanted to do something different than what the judges thought he had the power to do, basically, um, and and provided immediate check. And there was a lot of acrimony around that, too, because um, the very early period of the United States after George Washington becomes president is a very acrimonious time with, you know, really severe uh, you know, partisanship. Uh, so, I mean, it's not the first time we've dealt with this, okay. with this stuff. Uh, but, you know, it, what, the one thing that should be noted as true is that it's to uh, politicize the judiciary. Um, you know, the judiciary's job is supposed to be in applying it. And that, does, that, like science, that doesn't have a partisan cut. Uh, you know, like some, like one party might like this result, another party might like that result, uh, but that's not what's supposed to matter. What's supposed to matter is whatever the law is, you do it. 
Um, and when you, I mean, it, it's almost, we don't even think about it now. Like, it's almost natural to divide uh, members of the United States Supreme Court to, oh, he's a liberal justice, or oh, she's a moderate justice, or hmm. oh, he's a you know conservative justice, right? So, uh, but that's really a bad way to look at the court. Uh, and if that is true, then that's really uh, kind of ominous because the, the Supreme Court becomes, in effect, this, you know, weird de facto legislature and, you know, its decisions are viewed with, you know, partisan uh, suspicion. Uh, and that's not a good place for the court to be. Um, because when you when you politicize the law like that, you sort of are defeating the whole purpose of having uh, the law. You know, the law is supposed to be this, this system uh, of of rules hmm. that we set up in advance of a of a controversy, right, or a decision that we're going to have to make, you know, because we know as human beings we're emotionally fragile creatures, or not fragile, but you know, we we have a tough time making unbiased decisions, right? Yeah. Um, especially when there's real human beings in front of us that are going to be affected by our decisions. So you know, we get emotionally involved, and we have a lot of perception biases, and so on and so forth. So we set up these rules in advance to help to help guide us, and that's basically what the law is. Um, and when you remove that, and when you turn it into you know a political controversy, where you know a judge has to worry about how are people going to view me if I make X decision. Uh, when, when a judge starts worrying about that instead of worrying about what the law is, uh, you've, 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 you've destroyed the whole foundation of the law, basically. Um, and more germane to me, because I don't argue a lot of cases before the Supreme Court, you know, I, I, I haven't really been heard in that venue yet. Um, but uh, I would say uh, is, so we have district attorneys uh, in the United States, and they are elected. So this, these will be the, uh, the, the guys and, and the girls in charge of the prosecutor's offices. They are elected. Uh, public defenders are not, interestingly, but the, the district attorney for each county will be elected. Um, and that's very odd to me because a district attorney's job and, and the job of their deputy district attorneys is to, you know, enforce the law and to um, decide, you know, what law applies to what series of situations. And to me, that should not be a political job. Um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a judicial, that's a judicial function. Um, Mm. So that but when they get elected, at, mm. uh, no, no. So, yeah, uh, go, go ahead. Oh, I, I was, I was just going to say uh, that to, seems to be, be running to the concern you're making. Like that, 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 that is like t turning them into like being suspect of partiality, given that, um, uh, give, uh, given that that process of like them being appointed by, uh, uh, um by by someone in uh in in the executive branch suddenly does like paint them as oh well this person now like is suspect of being appointed because of political allegiance or because of political sway sure sure like i mean so in on the one hand the supreme court is much more well insulated than a district attorney is because the supreme court is appointed uh and they are appointed for life uh on good behavior like you'd have to commit a felony or something to get kicked off the supreme court okay. um but uh, so they don't really care about what people think, um, but you know they still have are certain to s subject to certain pressures because they have to be appointed by the president, who is a very partisan figure. Um, um, you have to understand that people, you know, view the legitimacy of the court, quote unquote, with you know a certain level of suspicion based on their decisions or whether they think it's being partisan or not. So yeah, they're subject to some political pressures. Okay. Um, but district attorneys are really subject to political pressures because they're directly elected. Um, so they have to do what the populace wants. And uh, a prime cause of a lot of what I would say is wrong with the criminal justice system in America is this fact that district attorneys in particular uh, and law enforcement to some extent, uh, you know, we have sheriffs elected and so forth. Um, they're elected. And so what that leads to is the district attorney doing not what the law demands, but what's politically popular. Um, and there's sometimes a distinction um, between what's just and what's popular, which is another reason we have law is to make sure we go for the <laughs> former and not the latter, right? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, the, you know, lynch lynch mobs are a very you know lynching somebody in the old days was a very you know popular way to deal with the problem, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's just, right? Um, so, you know, district attorneys are incentivized to do what the population wants, and sadly, in the United States of America, that almost without exception means being quote unquote tough on crime. 
Uh, and the way that a district attorney wins an election against someone seeking to unseat them is pointing to raw statistics, basically. They say, uh, my office prosecuted so many criminals, we got this level of time for them, of custodial time, um, and our conviction percentage overall is X. Uh, mm -hmm. And so in the real world, in the courtroom, this translates to deputy district attorneys are because their bosses are the, are the elected guy who puts pressure on them. They're incentivized to uh, charge the most ridiculous and on most serious crime the facts can possibly demand. Um, and I could tell some really bad stories of, of cases uh, even that I have uh, or have had recently that are really overcharged, as we say. Um, conviction. They care a lot about time. They care a lot about, you know, maximizing the time people spend in custody. Um, and they they won't get rid of a con they won't get rid of their charges even if that's you know obviously what would be just uh, in the situation given the circumstances because mm. they care about their numbers they care about their numbers because that's what's politically popular now that that's you know that's unfair you know for uh, for you know the benefit of you know the other side you know you'd probably want to hear from a district attorney about the position they're in right. but that's what I perceive as a big problem is that you know they don't have a lot of autonomy to do what is just because they're kind of married to doing what's politically popular hmm. and you know so they can get away with some level of you know caring about like act, actual recidivism i mean no one i don't I, I mean no one who actually works in the judicial system i think really believes that you know going to a prison is going to rehabilitate most people um but you know that's what we do you know we'd like we send people to prison because that's you know the punishment for their crime etc cetera, etc cetera. and you know when they get out you know they're gonna probably cause more crime because prisons are not facilities that you know uh, stop criminals from being criminals. You know they or you know in or teach someone how to live you know life as a productive citizen for the most part. I mean there are exceptions. You know there are good prison programs and so forth, but for the most part prisons are places where that increase recidivism. And you know in in a pure view of what a district attorney should be, they should be worried about that. Uh, and they should try to fix that problem by making sure the person is rehabilitated, if that's possible, uh, rather than just sent into prison for three years and then released, you know, even worse than they were before. But, you know, and, and they care about convicting the person, sending them to prison for so-and-so amount of time. If they get out and commit another crime, well, hey, well, you know, we'll convict them again and, you know, and so forth. So mm -hmm. that, that, that does, that's not a wise way to run a criminal justice system, basically, yeah. um, by marrying it to what's politically politically popular hmm. yeah and and that connects to a case that uh, you were personally talking about on facebook uh, regarding a school shooting that ha happened at, at your your school where, where you were expressing concern that um the the charges and their conviction made against someone who was in their early early teens when they committed this crime was not um in in your mind was not in proportion um <laughs> Or sure, the, sure. The, yeah, so, the so, length of their conviction. Yeah, so that case, uh, I'll describe a little bit. I don't any, owe any duty of confidentiality to this person because I'm, I'm not I'm right. Not his but it's lawyer. Still, it's it's still personal, so I understand if. Um... Oh, it's it's very no no. I'm I'm happy to talk about it. I I, I mean this is a good citation for me about you know how I feel about this stuff. Um, so, I mean, for those who don't know the story or didn't see that Facebook post, which I imagine will be most of the people who are listening to this. <laughs> um, so I. Um, I was, let's see, how old have I been, actually? Let's count. Uh, so that'd be 16, 17, 16 or 17 years old. Um, uh, dating myself, but, uh, you know, I don't care. <laughs> uh, so when I was 16 or 17 years old, I, um, I was in school, and we had a school shooting at my school. And this was back when uh, school shootings were uh, a media frenzy in the United States, which, I mean, it's kind of sad to say, but, like, you know, you could if you track like how big headlines were that a school shooting had occurred in America over a couple of decades, you would find that the headlines were getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. You know, even if the school shootings were more and more and more serious, right? So, um, like Columbine would be, you know, uh, and you know, it, you know, it, a school shooting could happen now where one or two people died, and it probably wouldn't even be front page news, to be honest with you. Uh, at least in different parts of the country, mm. um, like it, it takes an, an, an incident like the Sandy Hook incident to make front page news, where you see, you know these really really young kids are just brutally murdered. Um, 
that's what it takes these days to get the attention of the media. But anyway, I, I, I had one of these school shootings that was front page news back when it was still a big deal. Um, and uh, this shooter uh, killed two people and uh, wounded 15 um, and shot at um, a number of uh, other people and missed. Uh, and I was one of those people that he missed. Um, and... Uh, the, you know, the story of, of, of it really briefly of what I just experienced that day so that people know that, you know, no, this is this is something serious that happened to me. And I understand the gravity of it. So we were we were, you know, standing out in the in the, you know, in the quad, uh, you know, just hanging out or I wasn't in the quad. But, you know, I'm just to use high school terms, we were standing out, you know, in the, the area of the high school, you know, nice outdoor campus. And we hear these like pop, 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 pop sounds. It's really like light pop, pop, pop. We think it's firecrackers. Um, and then people start emerging from the bathroom where, you know, we're hearing these sounds uh, and people are bleeding and holding their sides and stumbling out. Uh, one of my best friends um, from uh, a very, very, we like, we'd been friends since like kindergarten. Like he had a collapsed lung. He was the first person sh who was actually shot. He lived, thank goodness. But God. he, uh, you know, he stumbled out bleeding and, you know, te there was a teacher in there and he, he just has his hand on his side and he takes it away and it's just, you know, the blood just oozing out, you know, very, you know, viscous, heavy, dark blood. That's, you know, that's scary stuff when you're a 16 year old. Um, so piece together uh, what's happening here. I'm like, what on earth? Did, like, did the firecrackers like go off like in, in a heavily densely populated area of that restroom? What happened? Mm -hmm. um, and so other people are running around. It's just chaos. Um, and so uh, and he just starts shooting at people uh, at random, you know. And, and it's that uh, it's that moment um, that a lot of people describe where time is seems to slow down, and you're just even though you're there, it's almost like you're watching a movie or something. It's like you're a spectator, you know, and you're just you're just watching it happen in slow motion or something. And it's just yeah. you know some classical song is playing in the background, and you know the the actual sounds of the situation are reduced to a mute almost, and you know it, it's that kind of you know Hollywood effect is put on it. Um, and you don't realize what's what's happening almost because it's it seems so you know unreal. Um, and I'm one of the people he shoots at. He just straight up points the gun, uh, and I'm never going to forget that. You know, having a gun pointed at you when you know the trigger is going to be pulled is uh, is an interesting experience. Uh, and he he pulls the trigger and he fires uh, and he misses me by about a foot high. Uh, and at that point, that's that's a good jar out of you know that uh, you know that movie scene which is in slow mo. Uh, and at that point, everything resumes normal speed and the sounds become very real. And they're like, oh, mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to die. I should probably do something about <laughs> that. And then the fight or flight kicks in and you're like, oh, mm -hmm. right. Uh, yeah, living. let's do that. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I survived that day. You know, he, he shot at other people and I, I got out of there. Um, so, yeah, that, that's what happened. And he, and he killed two people and he killed one person who died. Uh, you know, horribly, like literally sitting there bleeding out uh, on the on the pavement of the high school until his heart stopped beating. Uh, and I knew that guy. Uh, he was he was a good friend of mine. Uh, he was an even better friend of a friend. Like he was m one of my good friends, best friends, basically. So I knew who he was pretty well. And, he, you know, I would consider him a friend. But, you know, it's it's devastating to, to all the people around you. You know, lives were lost here. You know, really important, you know, real people who you know uh, and who you care for, you know, get just just get killed in this brutal fashion yeah. so um so that's that shooting um you know the shooter's story is is very predictable uh for a lot of school shooters you know he's you know mom's not really in the picture for him uh his dad you know is working hard but is rarely there and maybe has some emotional difficulties of his own you know he and there are guns in the house and they had just moved to california from you know i think maryland it was and he'd been there for two months and he's the new kid and you know, he's already got a lot of stress going on in his life. And then he comes to this new school and just gets bullied relentlessly. And he's starting to take a pretty nihilistic viewpoint towards the world. Um, and, you know, and he has access to guns and the inevitable ensues, right? So that that was basically, you know, why it happened. Um, his criminal case resolved. He didn't go to trial or anything. He, he took a plea bargain. He was tried in his, as an adult, which we do here in the United States. He was 14 at the time. You, you, we can take 14-year-olds and try them not in juvenile court as though they were adults uh, in certain circumstances. Um, certain laws have been passed since then, which makes it harder to do that, including this past November. We passed a referendum, which makes it somewhat harder to do that. Um, but we can try minors, very young minors, uh, as adults. 
Um, and, you know, he kind of got convicted of, you know, I don't know how many counts of, you know, attempted murder and murder and so forth. Um, and he basically, the sentence he got was that he would be eligible for, he was getting a life sentence and be eligible for parole when he turned, uh, I think, 67 or something like that. And he's 14 at the time, keep in mind. Right. Um, and that he'll be eligible for parole at that point. That's not saying he will be released. Um, that's an entire different, entirely different story I could tell about how the process for parole uh, releases. But he will be mm -hmm. eligible for parole at age 67. Um, and the point I make to people is that surely that can't be just. Um, or at least surely that can't be just if you take any consequentialist view of, of justifications for punishment. Um, and and PS consequentialist justifications for punishment are correct, so there can't be any any correct <laughs> any way that's right, you know. So um, and this is another class in law school. Like the law school actually imports a, a good bit of philosophy into it, especially in criminal law. And when you learn about criminal law, you know you argue about what the correct justifications for punishment are. Like why do we actually, you know, it seems odd. We're going to take this person, we're going to hurt him, and that's somehow you know a good thing. So how can that possibly be? Is is the question asked? And there are a lot of answers to that question, you know, um, but you can roughly divide them into consequentialist and non-consequentialist justifications. And when I say, for those of you not familiar with the term, consequentialism is a view saying that things are, are moral or right or good because of the consequences they have. Like if I buy an ice cream cone and eat it, that's a good thing because, you know, I enjoy having the ice cream cone and that's a good outcome. So that must have been a moral act for me to buy that ice cream cone. So, you know, you're doing, you know, moral good with a capital G when you eat ice cream. Um, whereas, um, yeah, so, so a lot, some of the consequentialist views that justify punishment are, uh, number one, deterrence, right? You don't want people to think that they can commit crimes just willy nilly and get away with it. So you punish people to say, Hey, this bad thing is going to happen to you, uh, if you commit this crime. So it has the effect of preventing future crime, both by that person, by other people who see them punished and go, Oh, I better not, you know, uh, steal or whatever it is. And then you lower crime, which is a good consequence. Um, so deterrence, you've got incapacitation, which, you know, suppose you have someone who's just like, you know, completely psychotic, you know, can't be cured and is just homicidal constantly 24 uh, seven. So you might want to just keep them in a cell the rest of their life just because, you know, they're not going to do well on the outside and it's not going to be good for them or anybody mm -hmm. else if they're out there. So you incapacitate them, you, you remove them from society and keep them from harming themselves or others. Uh, and that's that's a good consequence. Once again, uh, rehabilitation is another reason for punishment. We give sometimes give people punishments which change the way or try to change the way they think or operate, and so that they can be a functioning member of society. Uh, spoiler alert: I really like that justification for punishment. <laughs> um, and then there are non-consequentialist views. Um, uh, the context of criminal law as uh, retributive views, you know, and that view is this person did a wrong and we need to hurt them to, to, you know, restore the moral balance or, you know, to compensate uh, or not compensate the victims. Cause that would be a consequentialist view, you know, uh, but to, uh, to, you know, redress this, this moral wrong. The only way you can fix a moral wrong is by, you know, sort of rebounding it onto the person who committed it. And you know, you know, it's, it's, it's an eye for an eye, basically. Yeah. This, um, is, this, this is perhaps uh, too too flippant, but um, it's it's that thing where we often conflate revenge and justice. Yes, and, and so it, we got, it, and that's why that's why I that's my point. Basically, is that I just call that you know state sponsored vengeance, um, and to me, it's it's rather obscene because you know. It, it follows the same logic that the original criminal followed us, but in this case, anyway, you know, I, he's, he says, I'm being mistreated. I am suffering a moral wrong. Um, so because I feel this moral wrong, I'm going to revenge it with violence and restore, you know, you know, suffering unto suffering and hate unto hate and, you know, being mean unto people with being mean unto people. Uh, and, you know, there you go. He did so. And so we're going to react to that by doing the exact following his logic and doing something bad to him. Like, it doesn't seem right. Uh, it, it seems um, uh, it seems incorrect, uh, and not just because, um, as you know, any viewer of my stream would tell you, or anyone who knows me for more than three minutes and listens to me <laughs> for that, the, the, that three minutes will know. I am uh, I am a utilitarian consequentialist. I believe very strongly that you know moral acts are are justified by their consequences. But I mean, it, it, the logic of retributive criminal punishment, in particular, to me, seems just 
uh, it just seems perverse and obscene, and like it, it, it's it's following the the same logic that the criminal follows, um, and it's it 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 does seems like it can't be right. It seems like it can't be right, and so uh, the the cash out of that in this case is that um, uh, I have done some work to try and get him released. He's so I can't do directly work as his attorney uh, because I, there's a there. Yeah. There is a slight conflict of interest there, which even if I said I promise I'm, I don't have any ill will whatsoever towards you, I'm not going to like intentionally screw. You can't waive that conflict of interest, basically. Yeah. That's well, he tried to kill you. Maybe we should just get <laughs> someone else just to be safe, you know. Um, so uh, there, there's another lawyer, my my former uh, law partner, who does this kind of work, um, and she's going to you know do the law side of it, and my participation is going to be limited to. Um, of uh, defense lawyers' existence are victims' rights laws. So, um, you know, we've passed all these laws in California that say victims have certain rights when it comes to criminal prosecutions. Uh, they have the right to make a statement. They have the right to, sometimes to, you know, try to influence how the district attorney is going to dispose of the case, which seems ridiculous to me. I mean, that, that seems like giving the defendant the right to try to, you know, affect how, uh, you know, the case gets disposed or yeah. giving them the right to control the process, right? You know, they're an interested party. <laughs> you know, they should be the last person who gets to, you know, uh, you know, change the rules as right, it were. Right. Um, so, um, so I don't like those, uh, but I plan to finally uh, use them uh, to for my own benefit because you know people who have parole hearings are entitled to you know victims are entitled to come in and uh, and make statements, and um, I'm going to do that in his favor, and I'm going to say you know how dare you, basically you know th this is supposedly done uh, partially for my benefit. And I, I'm, I'm going to be here saying like, no, no, this, this is not to be done uh, in my name at least, because to me it's like a contravention of all I hold dear, so to speak. So, hmm. um, so yeah, that's 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 what's going to happen in that case. There was a Supreme Court case that came out recently. He'll be eligible for parole a lot earlier than we thought, hopefully. So, uh, sometime maybe even the next five years or so. So, hopefully, we're going to get rolling on that, and that would be. That would be nice if I got that done. Although it's a tough subject because there are a lot of people still, obviously, you know, high school friends and families and so forth that I still care about and, you know, who, you know, I was friends with uh, or I was a uh, boyfriend, girlfriend with in one event who um, they or their family don't feel that way about the case, <laughs> to, yeah. to put, it, to put yeah. it lightly. So, you know, it's, it's a touchy subject, but, you know, um, I don't I don't really compromise my views on it with them. So, uh, you know. Hopefully we'll be able to remain friends, nonetheless. But, um, uh, but yeah, that's the plan with that guy. And it's a, it's a sort of a good uh, example of uh, if you want to understand my worldview or why you know <laughs> I was you know born to be a public defender. Um, like that's that's the way I was uh, even at age sixteen when that occurred. Um, that was that was the concern. I thought that sentence was unjust. Wow, right on, right on. Um, if <laughs> I I guess my only piece of advice. Um, if if you do uh, uh, appear in a courtroom to to um, uh, give that support to him, you should probably like preface that the cane you walk with like wasn't because he actually hit you, but was like yeah. Separate so thing. so f funny funny story. I actually <laughs> tried to do without the cane in courts, um, and the reason for that is. Um, and this is this is getting off of like you know me standing on my soapbox and talking about you know oh public defense criminal defense criminal indigence blah 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 you know uh, rah 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 this is this is more now getting into the down and dirty business of like what a lawyer actually does and like lawyering skills and so forth but yeah um, everything about you um, in a courtroom is judged by a jury and uh, every perception is important uh, when you're doing a trial or anything else and um, but I can put down my cane and walk uh, a lot of the time. And, you know, if I have to handle exhibit or something, I will do that. Um, if I am seen walking with a cane and I put down the cane to go get something, uh, and like I, for some <laughs> jurors, that's like, oh, this guy has no credibility whatsoever. Look at this malingerer, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I try to do without the cane where I can in court. I'm, I, plus, just for other reasons, like I worry that, you know, that might be viewed as some kind of, you know, uh, you know, like milking it's, the crowd. It's, it's, 
way on the one hand, uh, and it might be viewed the exact, there might be the exact opposite problem might occur where someone might actually have, you know, people who are in wheelchairs and people who do, who walk with canes, uh, more so people who are in wheelchairs, but, you know, people who have physical disabilities are, can be the subject of prejudice and bias. Um, mm. And th th and this is a horrible thing to say, but, you know, when you're a lawyer, you take, you take what you have and you run with it. Um, but I have such a good thing going otherwise with, you know, playing to, you know, the biases of most people, you know, I'm a, a younger, you know, white, you know, you know, nice young man, you know, that, you know, even the most racist Southern grandma would, you know, <laughs> pro you know, tr you know, intrinsically trust, well, not intrinsically trust, but, you know, mm -hmm. I'm not, I have a crap ton of privilege. Um, and part of my job uh, as a lawyer is to weaponize that privilege, you know, um, you know, I stand next to people that you know are uh, and uh, and and prejudice. You know, here's you know, I'm in I'm in Southern California. Here's this Hispanic guy wearing a jail jumpsuit. You know, don't form any opinions about him, members of the jury. You're you're expressly forbidden, white people from mm -hmm. this rural county in California, from forming any opinions whatsoever about this Hispanic guy with like a scar on his face in a j orange jail jumpsuit form no opinions about him until the end of the case and they totally do that definitely that's not an unrealistic expectation yeah. at all uh, but no of course they do of course they do right you know racism is alive and well in the united states i mean the bias against people wearing orange jail jumpsuits is alive and well in the united states part of my job as i view it, is to take every advantage i can to offset that and if i have a crap ton of privilege as i do uh you know being a, a you know, a, a middle-aged white, you know, cisgender male, etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to take that and I'm going to milk that for everything it's worth in front of a jury. And if that means I don't walk with a cane until I absolutely have to, so that I'm even more, you know, down the middle of like, you know, uh, you know, what some people perceive as, you know, a fine, upstanding American citizen, uh, then yeah, I'm going to do that. Wow. Uh, so there, there's a lot to, to what goes behind that decision, basically. But mm -hmm. uh, suffice to say, it has been thoroughly considered. By me. <laughs> That's cool. It, it, it's, it's almost like a turning, turning the famous Ben Parker phrase, with great privilege comes great responsibility. Yeah, it does. Well, I mean... It's not so much that. I mean, that's certainly true, um, and you know that that's part of what goes into it. But it's also just about when you're a trial lawyer, you take anything you have and you right, weaponize it right. for your client. Uh, it and it that and that goes for the district attorney too. By the way, like you know, if you know, we we live in a county here that is does have a you know high Hispanic population, so has some some Hispanic jurors then, you know, the district attorney, if they have a Hispanic person in their roster, they might well throw them on there. You know what I mean? So you weaponize any perception um, that you can uh, in favor of your client. Although I often like to joke with the district attorneys that they don't have clients, but you know, their <laughs> response is, my clients, the state of Cal the people of the state of California. I was like, yeah, where are they sitting in this courtroom? Yeah. Um, so <laughs> they, but, but they, you know, fair, fair is fair. You know, I, lo I love most district attorneys. They, they do their jobs well, despite, you know, what I would say is their, the, the severe handicap under which they work. Uh, but they, you know, they would do that too. When, when you're, when you're a district attorney, for instance, you can't look too much like, like, um, for lack of a better term, you can't look too much like the man. You know, if, if you're willing just like an immaculate, you know, dark charcoal suit, and you're a white, old white guy, and you've got on like kind of like maybe a little too ostentatious jewelry and a watch or something, you're going to look too much like the man. You know, yeah. you're going to look too much like the government. You know, like you're the cold and person. You don't want to look like that. You want to look like mm -hmm. a normal human being. Like, you, you know, you want you want to dress down a little bit, if anything. You know, you want to look like, you know, you know, a simple country lawyer. Whereas um, I might actually want to, in the circumstances, but in some cases I might want to dress up. And I want might want to lend to, you know, my, you know, uh, for instance, you know, Hispanic, meth addict, uh, black, you know, some other disadvantaged or, you know, prejudiceable group if, if my clients one of those i want to lend them my my aura of, of privilege basically you know so i want to look more like the man so that you know people in the audience who you know are authority driven or you know trust some anything that comes from a young white guy you know like they i yeah, have yeah. that uh, to give to them and then again it varies very widely based on the case. Sometimes you want to look poor and or like, oh no, I'm a public defender. Please, you know, don't hold that against my client. You know, it's, it, it, tactics like that vary depending on the case. But you know, um, 
favored by by all lawyers, or at least by all good lawyers, anyway. Right, right. Hmm, that's cool. Let's talk about Spy Party for a bit. Yes, indeed. That's a good game. That's an awesome game. Um, it actually feels like, from this discussion, like very relevant, and I'm like not really surprised at all that it's a video game that that you were drawn to. Um, I never actually asked, like, what what did you first hear about or uh, play? I heard Spy about Party? it from. Um, I first heard about it on the day of uh, open beta release um, from uh, the old. So, so Penny Arcade used to have this. Uh, I think it's the Penny Arcade Report or something like that. Oh yeah, uh, that it used to be, uh, and, and it, it did a, before they shut it down. For, yeah, now defunct. Yeah, that's right. And and so it did a it did an article uh, on Spy Party's open beta release, and that's the first time I'd ever heard of Spy Party. Um, and so for, in PAX a few years ago, I told the premise, I, I love this moment, I told the premise of Spy Party to this guy, and rather than say anything, his immediate reaction was, was to withdraw a $20 bill from his hand, <laughs> hold it way up in the air, march right over to, to, to Alice and John where they were selling it, and basically take, shut up and take my money. Um, and that was my reaction to learning the premise of Spy Party. I immediately went to www.spyparty.com where you can buy the game for $15, and I did so. It is a steal. <laughs> a steal, and, my friends. It, it, it's it's a serious steal, and it's going to go on Steam. And if you're listening to this, you haven't bought Spy Party yet, which is extremely unlikely. What are you thinking? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Go buy Spy Party. Like if if you haven't heard of Spy Party, go to the go there and, and buy it right now. But yes, that that was how I heard of it. Uh, the Penny Arcade Report. Read that article. Like immediately, no further discussion, no further like oh maybe I'll wait until it gets settled. Nothing like that. No, immediately went over. Uh, the instant I finished the article about Spy Party, um, and it would be, immediately became annoying to everyone around me, saying oh my god look at this awesome game, uh, and that's basically been the way it is ever since. And uh, and the rest is history, as they say. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so um, Cr- Crazy Kaylee is like well established in the community and has played, God, several thousand games, including uh, streams in which he has played one thousand games straight um, over the course of like what twenty, thirty hours? Uh, like, think, how long does it take for that think, amount of games the, to happen? I think the fastest rate, <laughs> I'm, the uh, the fastest rate I've ever completed in one of my marathons is I did one thousand games in roughly about thirty hours. Um, yeah, which so was like uh, three minutes, very intense. two minutes to pop. Because like rounds. And yep. In but yes, I'm. They're they're not short, you know. I mean, I mean, I mean, they're relatively short. I mean, a round of Spy Party, you know, is uh, you know longer than a game of CS, a single round of CS:GO, for instance. But um, uh, it's it's not like a MOBA, certainly. I, I mean, what like about th- three or four minutes on average? Because mm-hmm. I mean, I mean. A full game that goes the distance will last like you know, depending on the map, three or four minutes. But you know, sometimes you get shot ten seconds in. So yeah. when when you when you average it out, I don't know, maybe three or four minutes. Hmm. Let's take a step back for a minute, uh, actually, because yeah. um, as, assuming some people might be seeing this who have have have, have not played Spy Party, and also to sort of like br- uh, bring the connection of why this is a game that for someone like Kaylee Anderson would would be of appeal. Um, what is Spy Party? I probably should have like started with this instead of. Yeah, no problem, no problem. So, Spy Party is an asymmetric one v one. I feel like I'm at PAX game of the speech again. Yeah. Uh, Spy Party is an asymmetric one v one v one game. So, uh, the way I explain it to people is there is a vast, fancy schmancy cocktail party of well dressed up, dressed to the teals people, VIPs, important persons, and they're having a fancy cocktail party. You know, in a in a usually in a you know kind of mansiony sort of environment. At the party is an AI, and if the person doesn't know what an AI is, because you know they don't have a lot of experience with gaming or whatever, you know everybody's a computer controlled player, except for one who is the spy, and that's the player. And they have to go around this party. They're secretly the spy infiltrating this party, and they have to do a bunch of secret missions. Like they have to plant, you know, listening devices on people, and they have to secretly steal certain items in a very subtle way. But they have to they have to be very careful and subtle while doing this, and they have to pretend to be an AI like everybody else because the other player in the one v one game is the sniper, uh, and the sniper sees the whole party from the outside and is looking at uh, everything they can, trying to figure out who the human player is uh, in this field of AIs. And they can do that by looking for, you know, who's not acting like an AI, who's doing something very human. Uh, or they can do that by looking for those little tells associated with the missions. Like maybe they see the arm go out slightly while the um, 
uh, while the you know the listening device is being planted on someone, or you know maybe they see them looking shiftily around while they steal something out of a book or so forth. Uh, so that's what Spy Party is basically. Hmm. Yeah, and and it um it it's very imp- impressive as a competitive game, um, as a high concept competitive game that it isn't like it's a novel concept but it like really holds its depth like uh the the degree to which two experienced players can really just um milk that play space for for all it's worth and um have have very like tense competitive games for like thousands upon thousands of of games it's um oh yeah oh yeah absolutely i mean i so this is not a brag i have played (laughs) more spy party than all but two people i think on the planet is Um, is steph catching up to you because she's like kind of insane steph steph is playing a lot of games she's played so she's got a ways to go to catch me certainly but she's playing games that are really good clip i think she's like somewhere near 20th on the leaderboard now. But but I'll tell you this. She's above, like, Sawchuck, who's been playing forever. She's above Slappy, who, who's, like, an active player that's been playing forever. You know, she's above, she's above R7 Stewart, who, who is, like, long regarded as one of the best spy party players. So, yeah, she's, she's climbing the, the table at a fierce pace. I think she's got around 6,000 games. Uh, I have something like 17,500 games. So I have played uh, more spy party uh, than everyone. Uh, except for drawn, drawn onward, who uh, I will probably catch during my next uh, 1,000 game stream, uh, and Virifo, who has, when you count his his, his alternate accounts, has played the most Spy Party. Hmm. Um, I don't say that to brag. I say that to give uh, gravity uh, to it when I say I don't even think I've begun to scratch the depth of this game. To be honest with you, like uh, I, I often talk about how it is. More, it, it should be thought of less like a video game uh, and more like uh, a legacy game like chess uh, or Go or something. And you know, that like I, I feel like you know, in a hundred years, there could be spy party players who have much more advanced knowledge of the game than I do who could easily crush me. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I, I am not regarded uh, as the worst spy party player in the world by any means, I'm, I'm not bad at the game. Uh, I've, I've got third most experience of anybody. Uh, I do pretty well in competitive events. I I'm not bad, but I feel like, nevertheless, our our current uh, the game is so deep, and we've spent so little you know collective time on understanding the game uh, relative to its depth uh, that I think uh, as time goes on and you know we sort of continue the the puzzle of unraveling yeah. what what is good spy party. The like, I think process. there there could be players. Yeah, exactly. There could be a, a player in like two with two thousand games in, uh, like, if Spy Party were played for a century, you know, you know, God willing, like, if Spy Party were played for a hundred <laughs> years, uh, uh, well, first of all, it wouldn't it won't have been released yet. But if, if this is the beta, is, I, I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. Chris I'm is kidding. slamming I'm kidding, his table. If you're listening, <laughs> I, I know, of course, yes, you know, but you know, he 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 definitely loves jokes about that. Bring it up to him at every every available opportunity. No, I'm kidding. But um, but you know, if if in a hundred years Spy Party is still being played. I feel like it's entirely possible, and indeed probable, that you know someone with a thousand games in you know twenty one hundred AD could easily crush Crazy Kaylee Circuit now, even though I have you know like nine times the actual game experience. Just because I feel like it's so deep, as we learn more about the game, uh, people will get better and better and better and better and better. And you know, if I, I hoped I tried to stay at the at the edge of that wave, getting better along with it, but you know, uh, mm. it, it's hard. <laughs> it's hard to do. It's it's a very challenging game. Yeah, well, especially to, and this will relate to our, to our last point of discussion, um, uh, the Spy Party Competitive League, which has been run a couple times and uh, we'll be starting up the third season, ho- hopefully soon. Um, you you used to be a sort of... Yeah, like, May, but, May. Well, well. Woohoo. May, yay. Um, uh, and I'll be competing that. You, you, you will not. So you previously were like um, sort of facilitator, like very much involved in, in organizing it, but now given... Uh, your responsibilities as a um, uh, state-level pub- public defense attorney, it, it's just not feasible for you to be um, as directly involved in it. Um, right, right. Yeah. Um, so it's so like, uh, how, how, where's the sort of balance for you now as far as like uh, being mindful of like not 
spreading yourself too thin as far as responsibilities and going, okay, I know that I can't commit this much time to, to this thing or that thing. That's, that's, been a, that's been a life problem for me that I have not solved. <laughs> it is not just apply to Spy Party. So, yeah. I, like, you know, I, I am the kind of person who always wants to do way too much, um, you know, has way too many hobbies, um, you know, in, in – Disaster. Like I didn't do terribly <laughs> in college by any means, but you know, I I wasn't you know you know four point oh perfect grade point average person because you know I was you know the, the, I was that guy who was a tour guide and running the fencing club and working for the radio station and doing you know casting for the soccer team Jesus. and uh, you know and, and you know, like and the list goes on from there right and you know and I, you know I get the feeling I know where the name Crazy Kaylee came from. Crazy with the K. You know, I just <laughs> did it because of Brian. Because my my old uh, my old what do we call those handles? Call signs. I, guess is... I don't know. I just think uh, it means like, usernames. Yeah, user usernames is probably the best way to go. Um, like I, I I used to call them gamer tags, but that just sort of betrays the fact that I I used to play a lot of games on the Xbox. Um, so I used to have an old handle, and that one was taken. I was like, well, what rhymes with Kaylee? This, I guess, it's sort of catchy, whatever. Hmm. Um, but but yeah, I, I do way. I try to put way too much on my plate, basically, uh, all the time. Uh, and I ha, you know I have a very diverse range of interests, and I try to pursue them all uh, in a very jack of all trades uh, kind of way. Um, and that certainly applies to my <laughs> my attempts to to do spy parties. So um, manage it is looking at. Um, you know, what, what do I contribute that other people can't or, or don't do in, in Spy Party? And what would other people do better than me? And what also takes up, you know, a severe amount of time for me that I, I can't, you know, I can't commit hmm. uh, at this point. So I, I just try to identify those things, say, okay, I'm not doing those things. Community are going to have to step up and, uh, and just hoping, hoping it goes well. I, I think, though, the thing I, I mainly contribute now is just being sort of a decisive voice. I'm sort of the the voice of the legion at this point. Hmm. Um, so like we get we're we're such a like collaborative cooperative community that it's sometimes resistant to making any decisive decision. You know, like like we'll we'll like if we want to talk about how something is going to work or rules change or something, like everyone will contribute their voice and make a really good point. But there's no one at the end of it to just say, okay, well I have understood the consensus and the decision is this, right? We just kind of all sit there with our opinion. Um, so I think my role at this point is to just sort of like gel, you know, the to you know listen to what people have to say and and gel that into into a consensus of some point, uh, uh, and just say, okay, well, this is what we're doing, you know, and I, I just provide a sort of decisiveness to it, um, kind of stuff I'm, I'm doing these days. I, I'm very, 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 very hands off. Um, I, I think what. What a lot of people are learning uh, as they attempt to, to fill my shoes in some places that uh, running SDL is actually a lot more difficult than it appears. Yeah. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of work that has to be done. Uh, and when you think about everything that goes on for SDL, so we have uh, a cast, which by itself is, you know, a very, you know, a time consuming process, especially if you want to make it even remotely approaching some kind of like serious esports production um, mm. of last season. Uh, one for the NA time zone, one for EU time zone. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a lot of work. You know, somebody's got a. Uh, I, I made a post recently on the forums about this, but you know, here's what you know you've got to do. You've got to pick the games. You've got to arrange your lineup of casters. You know, you've got to make sure you've got you know some kind of production values for that stream so it doesn't look trashy. Mm, uh, not picture. that I did a great job doing that by any means, but you've <laughs> got to have something, right? You got to yeah, try. Yeah. Um, you've, you've got to line up your casters, get them ready to go difficulties, you know, and then, you know, set it up, talk to chat, and, you know, you're putting on a show. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that, that's, that's the cast alone. You've I mean, like, when you talk about the, the work of scheduling games, uh, you know, trying to, to urge everybody gently but firmly to play their games in a timely fashion. Um, occasionally I would rule on rules disputes, but that's not super time consuming, so I'm still going to do that. Hmm. Um, yeah, that's like reflex whatever. for you, I assume. Yeah, yeah. I, I, <laughs> I that's have this the, question about how this logical system rules interact. Yeah, I was like, yeah, I can help you with that. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. The main things that I'm handing off this season are number one, the cast. Um, I might, I might still cast from time to time because it's a lot less work for me to just sit down in a chair and talk about Spy Party uh, than it is to, you know, 
put on the show in the first place. So uh, we're very lucky there. We've got a lot of people who are able to run the show. Uh, we've got, uh, I think, Cameraman, Hummus, and Tobo are going to uh, to take on the NA uh, hosting this year while uh, SG Nerf and Yerand are going to do the EU uh, uh, hosting. Mm-hmm. And uh, Godspeed to them. And I'm going to try to help them in any, every way I can because uh, that's that's a hard job. Um, so hope, hopefully we'll they'll pull it off. Uh, and all of those folks are like really good, uh, longstanding members of the spy party community. So they will do it. I have no doubt. Mm. Um, and we have a lot of casters too. Uh, so hope we, we should be doing, we should be having a good show for, for the SEL cast. So, and probably a better show than, than I'd put on because that's a low bar. <laughs> so, um, so hopefully that'll go well. Uh, so that, uh, I'm, I'm passing off that work. Uh, I'm passing off a lot of the administrative work of like, you know, placing people in divisions and, Dealing with the standings and so forth, and uh, catnip, uh, catnip fields, and uh, Elvis snake have been the uh, the people have been sort of my 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 go to people for doing the work of like you know messaging people and go hey are you still active you need to do this and that and the other before you can start um, so they they've been uh, and then I guess the last thing is actually you know running the tournament uh, or the the event I guess we call it a season and you know collecting results and posting replays and that. That is being uh, done with the wonders of automation with uh, Lieutenant Hummus's uh, uh, scheduler, uh, which a, f- a forgotten tune is also working on. Um, and that, uh, that piece of software will hopefully uh, make all our lives a lot easier. Uh, so fingers crossed for that. Mm-hmm. Yep. Com- com- computers, the foundation and bane of modern man. <laughs> As we were talking about, yeah, yeah. Sharper had some, uh, had some difficulties getting the, the recording started today. And we were talking about c- c- computer. Computers are, are horrible and wonderful, and they're horrible because they're so wonderful that when they break, <laughs> it's very it's very traumatizing to us. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so Spy Party is a, is an interesting game. The, the, to, to get back to the intersection of um, of Spy Party and and you know my work as a lawyer, I guess. I mean, one thing it certainly does is it, it sort of teaches you. And so a, a lot of people, uh, you know, they get on a witness stand. They say, I know with one hundred percent accuracy that that's you know that's the guy. Uh, you know, like my perceptions are flawless and I know that's the guy. And they're, what they're con- doing is conflating like realistically what's like a 55% chance of, of certainty with, with 100% because a lot of people have that 100 to 0 bias. Either something's true or it's not, you know. Yep. Uh, and, you know, there's there's no room for, for the way they view it. So uh, what Spy Party does for that, and I wish I could get every juror who has to decide on a piece of eyewitness testimony to play spy party uh, what spy party does is it teaches you how bad you and every other human being is at at, at you know uh, collecting like information and being certain about it mm. uh, there's like information going on in your periphery um, it teaches you about that really effectively <laughs> and um, <laughs> it's uh, any you know player who's trying to try to learn spy party and that includes me will tell you um, when you're the sniper in Spy Party, um, it is drilled home to you how use yourself, how easy it is to suffer from bias, uh, you know how easy it is to miss things that are, happen right in front of your face, under your nose, mm-hmm. um, and you could swear things happen that absolutely did not happen, and vice versa. Um, you know, human beings are bad at you know detail-oriented perception. <laughs> they are really, really bad at it. Um, and but spy party, but have no fear because with spy party you'll get better at it, mm. uh, or at least you'll get better at it in this l- one limited context of looking at people in a party trying to do this specific mm. limited set of actions. But you know it's a valuable lesson to, to learn uh, for sure. Um, and regardless of getting uh, better yeah. at it, one of the other valuable things is just to become comfortable with that process, to become comfortable with being uncertain, because we have we have this problem. That's a great in, point in in society where we view like uncertainty and ambiguity as things to cause like anxiety or fear and it's like no the world is an uncertain place and you need to be absolutely com- both comfortable with that while still making active decisions i think a lot of people have a lot of trouble with right is um you know if they have less than perfect information on something uh they they're like well how can i make a decision i'm like you have to work based on probabilities you know you have to work you know, we're never going to have perfect knowledge uh and in spy party um, you know, very often as the sniper, you don't have perfect knowledge or even really that great knowledge. You know, you're, you're working on a coin flip. I mean, it might be a 51% versus 49% thing, but, you know, you pull the trigger on the 
51 percent you know just as decisively as you would on a you know 100 percent chance because you know what else are you going to do hmm. um well, and, hope, and you, you and yeah spy party is great at teaching you that yeah yeah no it's going to say well well first you hold left shift and then you <laughs> press the mouse button. there you go that's yeah. right that's right that's right so, so that's important. That's important. Yeah, yeah. That's that otherwise. that that's an important part of the process. Like, do that first, then make a decision. Mm. Cool. Well, so, so spy party is, I guess, um, important in a couple of other ways with regard to the law. I mean, one is that it it teaches you to think very empathetically, and it teaches you uh, to try and analyze a problem from the perspective of the person trying to defeat you. Um, it's really so. It, it's good at teaching people basically de facto game theory, like because um, it's a game with a lot of um, not just Yomi, not just like rock paper scissors type stuff, but also you know you have to learn to think what someone is thinking based on you know what the very limited amount of information they give you, uh, which in some ways makes it a lot like poker. So that's obviously valuable a lot. Um, the other way I think it's valuable is that especially the way I play Spy Party, I play a particular style of, of Spy Party uh, on the sniper side, which uh, is relentlessly uh, internally self-perfecting. Um, and it's very zen. That's pretty helpful to a lawyer, I guess I would say. So uh, it, it, it really teaches you to, to train your mind. Uh, and that's that's kind of what at the core of being a good lawyer is. is uh, you know, your, your lawyer brain is very different from your, your average, you know, non-lawyer brain mm. and you have to you have to constantly work on that when you're a lawyer you know what, how a lawyer thinks um is is very different from how a normal person thinks about most and while i to some extent you know was born you know thinking about you know the world as as you know in terms of cases and facts and and logical you know relationships um you know it, it's something you always have to work on and um and spot practice is a great tool for you know if for for teaching patience with that process and you know and tolerance for tolerance for failure <laughs> and tolerance for you know how difficult it is to really train your mind uh, to to operate on this difficult problem um, and so in that spot practice are actually quite similar. Awesome. Well, I think that's a good place to stop. It. Thank thank you very much, Kaylee. This has been a, a, a wonderful hour and a half conversation. Absolutely, yeah. Thanks for thanks for sticking around and and keep, keep coming through with me. That was a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, any, anytime, man. Anytime. So, um, uh, I guess uh, where can people follow you if they want to like hear more from the accomplished criminal defense attorney <laughs> Kaylee Anderson? So, so I'm on Twitter. I'm on, I'm on Twitter at Crazy Kaylee. Uh, I uh, I post there about uh, both gaming stuff and, and law stuff. Uh, I, uh, I have a blog, crazycaselet.tumblr.com, uh, which actually hasn't been updated since the, since the November election for, for a lack of data. Uh, it, it's sort of a, a data commentary. It's sort of a polls analysis kind of thing with occasionally my rants about politics in it. So there was a heavy spike of it, uh, in the, uh, November elections, <laughs> uh, and related to the November elections. Uh, mm -hmm. but since then it, it's, it's not been, not been super frequently updated. But but still, I, I post stuff there. If you if you're into politics, that's a good place to follow me. If you're into gaming and or the law, Twitter is a good place to follow me. Uh, if you're into gaming or the law, probably the best place if you're interested in, in Kaylee related stuff uh, is my Twitch channel, twitch.tv forward slash crazy Kaylee. Um, I occasion I, I don't get to stream nearly as often as I would like uh, anymore. Uh, their uh, gaming stuff, but um, I am working on right now a uh, basically. Uh, I was inspired by uh, once again Lieutenant Hummus, who did a uh, a programming uh, a introduction to computer programming course uh, on uh, on Twitch, uh, and it was it was really good. Uh, and um, what little knowledge I command of computer programming comes largely from that course. Um, and I'm, I'm by no means a coder, uh, but it's a gr it was a great course and it was really inspirational because the way he was able to make it, you know, to to give it this you know, cool uh, you know medium. Uh, so I'm going to tr try to do the same thing uh, with the law. I'm going to try to give basically, oh, I mean, it's going to take a long time to do this because like each individual subject is going to take a bunch of, you know, sessions, but, uh, and I'm going to, you know, have to stop in the middle of it to write more stuff and so forth. But uh, basically the dream eventually is to have a collection of videos, which basically uh, simulates uh, law school in the United States. 
States education and what the kinds of things you talk about. And while that's probably not going to be useful to anyone who actually tries to become a lawyer and hmm. certainly don't take that as official legal advice, of course, but <laughs> it, 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 I'm hoping it'll, it'll succeed in the same way that Hamas's uh, course succeeded by being this kind of interesting look into, into this, this world of ours. So that's going to be on twitch.tv forward slash crazy Kayla as well, uh, starting in late May. Awesome. Well, I, I, I can imagine that being very popular given um, uh, the the sort of boom in the last few years of sort of um, uh, cr uh, YouTube crash courses on various topics. Um, yeah, that, that's that's been a that's been a big deal recently. I, I don't know of any lawyer who's tried to do it um, because, in large part, <laughs> you know, lawyers are people, and mm. uh, one thing. Lawyers Lawyers know is if you claim to be an expert on something and post some advice about it on the internet, uh, and then someone follows that advice and something terrible happens to them, you might get sued. Uh, so certainly, this course will be preceded with with plenty of uh, qualifications not to use it as official legal advice, and certainly not to pretend to not, to presume that you are a lawyer or know have a similar knowledge of the law based on it. But mm -hmm. uh, I am gonna I'm gonna put it out there and just say. More as a, you know, the flavor it's going to be like, here's, you know, let's let's talk about the law. Let's dig in a little bit. Let's find out what the rationale is behind this stuff. Let's provide you with some of the context you need to, to understand what's going on in the world, especially in the world of the law. Mm, awesome. No, it'll it'll certainly help as far as liability. The, the title will be uh, uh, a, a, like course in, in law as presented by Crazy Kaylee. It's like, well, the guy said he was crazy. Exactly. So yeah. it's like, you know. Yeah, you, being caught, like the title on it is crazy Kaylee's guide to the law. Like, I mean, you're <laughs> trusting a guy who has crazy right there in the name and, and he he's spelling it with it. a K. Yeah. I mean, exactly. Right. I mean, how could you possibly have the expectation that this was competent legal advice? Right. So yeah, needless to say, I do not introduce myself to my clients as crazy. Kaylee. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's uh, that would be a questionable decision. Hmm. Anyway, thank, thank you very much, sir, for this interview. And um, uh, we'll, see everyone or uh oh I'll, I'll come up with a better outro next time but thanks everyone for listening <laughs> all right take care thank you sure for great interviews